If you think love starts with a partner, then change the way that you think. If you think love is dates and texts, it fades as you blink. Love is more than quick attention and praise, or who pays for a drink. Love is the ship moving through water that the ocean can't sink. Love isn't to break up and a swipe right. Love is to make up and to fight through. Love is when you aren't spiteful when you're hurt. It's forgiving and giving those who change a take two. Love is being able to say no and knowing what to say no to. Love is more than how you treat them. Love is how you treat you. If you don't have love for yourself, then nobody will. We settle for one night stands, for rebounds and pills. We buy each other booze that we can barely pay bills. We inflict pain to forget pain. These are short-term thrills. And that's what kills. Because tomorrow we'll look back and realize we could have done better. We seek our other halves instead of seeking to be whole and then together. I don't want to be half and find the one to get through. I want to be the one and find the one to make two. It's true. We go looking for love like spots on a map. It's when you love yourself that it falls in your lap. Podcasting for the Art Gallery of Mississauga, this is Border Crossings, a podcast where we listen to stories and experiences from artists, innovators, community activators, and people living creative lives. I'm your host, Vassandra, and I can't wait to unpack the magic of border crossings with you. Are you curious about living a creative life fearlessly? Then hang tight for a dose of inspiration. Hi, Wally. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. How are you? Just surviving, literally trying to make it through this this uh, pandemic, but at the same time, learning a lot about myself through the challenges that, that are that are coming. Yes, yes. And I think you wrote this poem, Thank You, Mrs. Saga. And yeah. could you share a behind the scenes point of view on it? What were you going through when you wrote it? And what inspired you? Uh, when I wrote that, I was, I mean, living in Mississauga is something that, you know, I've been a resident here for the past, like, 16, 17 years. Um, to be able to, to partner with the city of Mississauga was a great opportunity for me. And I wanted to write something that would give uh, some hope and, and uplifting uh, words to the people that live here right now at a time of uncertainty and crisis. And so when the city had reached out with that opportunity, I was, I was more than happy to help my, my community and support them. Um, I just, I feel like at that time, it was something that people needed to hear. I'm not, I'm not someone who likes to, you know, hide behind, uh, you know, Twitter or, or, or just jump on a bandwagon. I like to create art whenever, whenever I'm going through something. And so what I really wanted to do was just capture uh, the feelings behind what everyone was was going through and experiencing through my art as opposed to simply just, uh, you know, jumping on a bandwagon like, oh, we're all going to make it through this and say something cliche, uh, but really mm -hmm. say something artistic and powerful that had more meaning. And so uh, that's really the inspiration behind that piece. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. And I think it turned out to be um, incredibly beautiful. Thank you for putting that message together for us. Um, Wally, I know in your interviews, you've mentioned two teachers that restored your faith in yourself in many ways. Do you have a specific incident with these teachers that you would like to share? Like maybe, maybe a story or maybe a moment that was really a turning point for you. There's, there's a few moments that I feel like were very important for me. One of the, one of the first moments was when I was in in high school at, in grade in grade ten, and uh, my teacher Miss McIntosh she invited me to come to We Day, which is a, a massive youth leadership event where. 20,000 kids, uh, they come together at the Scotiabank Arena and there's motivational speakers and performers that come and perform. And I was I was sitting at the top level, like the 300 section of, of the arena, listening to some of these speakers. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm really lucky to be here. And this is a fantastic event. And one day I, I want to be on that stage. And I told my teacher that one day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on that stage performing. 
And uh, 10 years later, I got to bring her backstage as a performer when I was performing at We Day. And that is, that is the cool the full circle story um, that I never really thought would even happen. But, uh, you know, the world, the world works in, in, in mysterious ways. When you put your energy and you manifest positivity and you want to do better for the world, the world gives you that in return. Yeah, that's incredibly powerful. So how did you discover that there was a poet in you or a spoken word artist in you? Well, I always liked, I always liked music. I was always interested in writing, but I never, I never knew what spoken word was. And so in high school, uh, another teacher, Miss Riley, she introduced me to spoken word poetry and she gave me a book uh, written by Tupac Shakur. And the book was filled with Tupac's poetry. And, and a lot of people don't know this, but uh, the three letter word rap is an acronym and it stands for rhythm and poetry. So poetry and hip hop and rap are are very interconnected. And so I was a, I was a big fan of rap music, a big fan of Tupac. And reading his poetry in this book really inspired me to try to just challenge myself to write my own, even though it was something that I had never truly considered before. And so that's when it started. And I, and I remember writing my first poem in grade 11 in Miss Riley's English class and sharing it with the students in my class. And, uh, you know, I was so scared. And it was my first time ever sharing anything personal but mm -hmm. uh, i got up there in front of 30 students and and i shared my first poem and and it was it was nerve-wracking but it was also it was also a very powerful moment for me to step outside of my comfort zone and i never looked back after that do you still have that poem with you i i would have to oh that's an oh, well, i was like nine years old um <laughs> i have to find it but i did write it I, it's it's in a word document somewhere do you remember the theme or like what was it about the theme was about personal narrative so i was talking about some of the things that i had i had dealt with growing up as a teenager growing up with immigrant parents mm -hmm. coming from a from a strict south asian family and just my own experience with you know what my parents wanted for me uh mm -hmm. you know compared to what i wanted for myself and dealing with trying to fit in and being cool and popular in high school you know that's the the biggest priority for kids right so that was really the the gist of it i can definitely connect the dots from uh, that point in your life to now when you're still kind of uh, you know able to articulate your current situation and you know put that uh, through into a poem or a, or you know words that can actually perhaps inspire people. And, you know, it just sounds like it comes from the most authentic space for you. So I'm keen to know what inspires you the most? Um, what inspires me the most is to be able to be a role model for the kids that, that need it because I never had a role model growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was younger, I was the oldest out of my family. And so, there was a very, there was a very strong emphasis placed on my parents that I had to lead by example for my younger siblings. And, you know, unfortunately, I, I never really lived up to that for a long time because I just never really saw myself as a leader. I didn't think I had the qualities that it took. I wasn't interested in, in trying to be a role model for anyone, but I think the main reason for that was because I never really had strong mentors and role models in my life. And me and my parents, although I love my parents, we were, we were butting heads on a lot of things, right? Like they wanted me to, you know, be a lawyer or a doctor and I, and I wanted to pursue my art. They didn't understand it very much. They thought I was wasting my time. And because we were at odds uh, for the majority of, you know, my younger years, I never really felt like I could relate to them more or try to, you know, share my experiences with them like they just wouldn't understand it and so for me to be a role model to anyone else was was a difficult thing to think about but it was one that i i knew that i had to be because if i had power and potential in the words that i was sharing and if i had a powerful message to share that mm -hmm. you know people would listen to that and maybe it could change someone's life with what i had to tell them and so i think eventually what, what ended up happening what was really important for me was to realize that you know, I had the power to change someone's life with the words that I share and with the poetry I create. And if I've been given that talent, then I want to use it for the right things. And, you know, that starts at home. And so 
really just convincing my parents that what I wanted to do was bigger than myself and to start by just being a better brother, being a better son, and then looking at being a better friend and being a better role model for people in my community. And, and I think, you know, when you put your head in the right, in the, in the right state of mind, um, you know, good things happen. Good things happen. You know, I face a lot of challenges, right? Like growing up with you know, immigrant parents wasn't easy. Growing up in a low social economic neighborhood wasn't easy. You know, growing up, we saw, you know, drug dealers in the, in the lobby of our building, right? We saw people who, you know, who, who lived a lifestyle that, that quite honestly just wasn't the right, the right way to live, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you grow up in an environment where that's your, like your reality mm -hmm. and, you know, people get, people get arrested in, in your, in your neighborhood, like on a daily basis, um, you, 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 you either become part of that or you want to be better than that. And I wanted to just rise up and be better than that, seeing that happen. And so I think that was like my main motivation to just keep pushing and trying to be better. Yeah. And that takes a lot of courage. So thank you for putting in that effort. Um, talking about, you know, creating your work, I'd like to know what your process is like. I know people go through hardships in life, but they hardly ever kind of sit down and, you know, write a poem about it or write about it. So what's your process like, really? It sounds like it. all of your work comes from a space of, you know, rising above your your environment and creating something that you probably can't even see in front of your eyes. So how do you go about doing this whole thing? I think the biggest thing for me is to, to think about what experiences are relatable that people want to hear from or, for, or hear about rather, because everyone goes through hardship. Everyone has negative experiences, myself included. And even even right now is is a difficult time for me in my personal life as well. But the whole idea is to think about how I can use those experiences to benefit others. What am I doing that can that can help someone else if I share this? And that's that's where I've been for the past couple of years with what I write about. You know, it's not about oh, I need to write something because this is going to, it's a trendy topic. It's going to get a lot of views. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I want to write something that speaks to people, that mm -hmm. speaks to the hearts and souls of individuals, right? Like when you're going through a breakup, for example, like the poem that I shared in the beginning, mm -hmm. that is an example of something that I feel like needs to be shared with people that are going through something similar and they need a message of just loving themselves. And that's why I wrote it because I've been in that situation where, it's hard. It's hard to think about, you know, moving forward and, and being with someone else and loving yourself or who you are when you've just gone through this horrible breakup and, you know, you're angry, you're resentful, you feel like you wasted your time. Uh, but it's a message that needs to be heard and it's a message that people need to remember. And I've, I've gone through that experience and I know what that hurt is like. And so that's why I want to share my words and, and hopefully, uh, you know, spare someone else of that pain and just give them a small reminder that they'll get through it if they love themselves. I think those are the simple moments that can really benefit people. Right. Uh, Wally, could you share a few lines from your favorite work? Uh, yeah, apart from the poem that I shared in the beginning, mm -hmm. one of the poems that I've written that I'm really proud of is, uh, is a poem about masculinity. And mm -hmm. it's called Dear Future Son. And mm -hmm. so this is, this is a few lines from uh my 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 poem about my future son to my future son when i was a kid i was told that big boys don't cry that instead of expressing my emotions that i should lie hide behind a mask to get by conditioned to believe that i should be one of the tough guys and put on a tough guys it's not a surprise that innocence dies at the age of 10. Or maybe it's just that pop culture lies to us then because we've got our eyes on a TV mesmerized by the men who reinforce patriarchy and hyper-masculine trends. I had friends get bullied for wearing pink because in fourth grade, the color of your shirt could make you stink. 
And in 12th grade, you were a little girl if you didn't drink. It's sad to see the way society thinks. My son, being a man doesn't mean being aggressive. You want big biceps, but a big heart is so much more impressive. And honestly, some of these bodybuilders are a little excessive. And young kids wanting that makes me so sad because why would anyone want to be a balloon animal so bad? That's a little bit of my, my poem, the first half. Well, it tempted me to change my mind and I feel like listening to the whole poem now. <laughs> <laughs> would you mind sharing? Sure, I'll share the rest of it. Well, thank you. It's okay, son, I've been there and I understand. Even Jim Carrey will tell you, it's easy to get by wearing masks. We live in a society that makes it so hard for young kids growing up who don't know where to start. I see the consequences of families that split up and get torn apart. So I won't let my child give his mother a Father's Day card. We live in a world where rappers pay women to get naked in videos for more promo. The intent is tapping that girl while double tapping her photos. And sex makes a boy a man, but it's a girl labeled promiscuous though. And boys won't say they love each other unless it's followed by no homo. But I want to teach my son that if he argues with a woman, he doesn't have to raise his voice or raise his hand to treat a woman like he would treat his daughter and learn respect as a man to love his mother through old age and do whatever he can. But first, I need to ask myself, is that the man that I am to lead by example? Because in this day and age, we get consumed by the tricks up the media sleeves, misguided by the information we receive. Reality TV and the movies we see have become the basis for what we believe. Unfortunate that power is used to mislead and that the young can't always understand the things they perceive. So when you grow up and see this world firsthand, I pray that you act on these words whenever you can, so that maybe one day your son will understand that love is the first step to being a man. Thank you. What was a turning point in your life that inspired you to write this particular piece? Um, it's a, it's a bit of a story. My, my, my prof in university mm -hmm. was a, a great, a great teacher, uh, Jane Baker at UTM here in Mississauga. And so, uh, you know, when I walked into our, our class, it was a, it was a class called the sociology of masculinity. And to be honest, I, I only taken this class because I needed to, to fill up my prerequisites for my program. And uh, so the sociology of masculinity, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I walked into the class and I knew Professor Baker, she was a really good teacher. And when I walked in, there's 60 students in the class and 57 of those students are women. And so I'm a little confused, like why are there so many women in this class? This is kind of weird. Sociology of masculinity, shouldn't there be more men in this class? <laughs> but I sat down and you know, it felt a little awkward being one of three guys in the class. But when I sat down and I started listening to the to the lecture, I was really moved because I was learning so much about what had challenged my perspectives on masculinity. You know, things like the wage gap, the discrepancy of money paid for the same work between men and women, uh, you know, the ideas of patriarchy and, and a system that has been established to keep women as subordinate to men. It, it really opened my eyes to things that I, I, I knew existed, but I had never understood the, the depth of. And so for the first time, I was learning about these things and understanding my own privilege as a man. And at the end of that class, on, on the last lecture, before our final exam, I, I had talked to Professor Baker. I said, I wanted to write something that would summarize my experience with this because writing is all about experiences as i mentioned before mm -hmm. and so when i when i shared this poem with the class mm -hmm. you know the the prof loved it and everyone was was 
was really moved by. But what it made me realize is that, you know, as a man, I have a, a responsibility to recognize my own privilege and to be able to to support women and 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 really be a stronger a role model for other men who who don't often have these conversations with other men. And so, you know, being there for the women in my life is important, but being there for the men who don't have these conversations is equally as important. And this was a poem that I started to use in some of the work that I was doing with young men uh, when I was workshopping with schools. And so, you know, going to a class with 30 boys who have never had these conversations before, this was a great way to introduce the topics and really get them thinking about it. So that is uh, the story behind this piece. Right. Well, thank you for sharing that here. Um, talking about writing from your experiences, what is a day in the life of a poet laureate? Yeah, I mean, poet laureate, being the poet laureate from this saga was actually a lot of fun. You know, I was invited to speak at different civic events. Uh, Remember Words Day, for example, they wanted me to read Fran Flanders Field. Um, yeah, for Canada Day, they wanted me to write a poem for Canada and my experience with, 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 with living in Canada. And so it was writing pieces and performing pieces for different civic events, which was really, I think, a, a powerful experience for me because it helped elevate my my profile as an artist working with the city and having that uh, that powerful brand of, of a municipality behind my work. And so, you know, it was a lot of fun and getting a chance to to meet a lot of great people in my community and and keep myself busy with my writing was was a great way to prepare myself for a future career as an artist. Right. Um, I also know that you've won the RBC's Top 25 Immigrant Award, and uh, there's a transformation story behind it. Uh, could you talk about that and your life after that? What's changed? Well, I mean, as I mentioned before earlier on, you know, when my parents came to Canada, there was a lot of struggle for them. They had, they, they had, they had to really grind for whatever they had. You know, money was not easy. Learning a new language was not easy. The people in my life, my parents, my extended family, have struggled very hard to be here. And I know that I need to work hard and I need to honor what they have done. And so, you know, I think for me, one of the big things that, that I that I really felt this award was, was was for me was that I remembered that me being here in, in Canada and getting this award was thanks to so many other people that made this story possible, you know, and to, to be able to really honor my parents and to think about all the struggles that we went through and even all the, you know, some of the, some of the arguments that we had over time, right? Like that not understanding my career path. And yeah. So, you know, I think just to be able to honor my parents and to be there was a really powerful moment for me. And of course, you know, being a young South Asian man and with a voice, with, 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 with a talent, with, with an opportunity, you know, my life was, was more than just uh, me trying to, you know, do something for myself, but really uh, me trying to pay it forward to a generation of immigrants, paying forward to a generation of South Asian youth that are going through the same experiences. And for me to get that award, not only was that an opportunity to amplify myself, but to amplify their voices and to remind them that, hey, if I can do it as a young South Asian immigrant, uh, you can as well. And so I think really that was the biggest that was the biggest moral of the story for me that there's going to be other young kids who are going to see this and think, you know, Wally did it. That means I can too. And, you know, I came from a, a tough neighborhood and I came from a, you know, an at risk background where I was, I was getting into trouble and I, I needed something to get me out of it. And mm -hmm. it was those teachers and it was, you know, my, my art form that got me through it. And, you know, getting an award like this is a, is a, is a massive, prestigious uh you know moment in my life but if i can do it then any of those kids can do it as well that's incredibly inspiring um wally what is your message or advice for new and emerging poets and spoken word artists who aspire to be like you 
you know, I just, I just want kids to share their stories with the world. You know, I, all I ever wanted was to be able to be heard. You know, it wasn't about having a massive platform or winning awards or being famous. I just, I wanted to be heard. I wanted to be true to myself and what I was experiencing. And I just want kids to be able to do the same. I want these young, you know, young kids in Mississauga that I see in the streets, that I see, you know, in the park and the basketball courts that I go and play at, you know, before COVID, obviously. Um, I want them to be able to have an opportunity to share their voice. And one of the biggest things that I'm proud of in my life that I got the chance to do was last year, I partnered with the city of Mississauga and we got to organize the first ever Mississauga Youth Poetry Slam in our community's history. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we had over 200 people be a part of it. We had 25 poets. Uh, All of of them were young poets from the community, share their work. And it was a powerful moment because I never had that when I was younger. We never had something that the city of Mississauga put together where young kids could share their poetry at. And to be able to provide that for a group of young people was honestly, it was the best feeling ever. It was better than performing in front of a 10,000 people uh, audience. It was, it was being able to lay the, the groundwork and, and provide the seeds for what was going to become a powerful movement in the future in my community where there were young people that were going to carry this forward and, and, and there was going to be more people sharing their stories and being, uh, being comfortable and being and being themselves and sharing their stories in front of other people. That was a powerful moment for me. There were 16 year old kids that got up there and, and talked about Islamophobia and talked about um, bullying and what their experiences were. That was powerful. And I wish I had that opportunity growing up as a kid, but there are people who have that opportunity now. And so my advice is to take those opportunities when you see them because people like me never had them. And so, you know, what's challenging is going to help you grow. And these are the opportunities that will challenge you and help you grow and take them when you can. Yeah. Thank you for working with the community and for giving so much of your talent and your time back. Uh, I know you shared you're going through a tough time personally. I hope for you that your art form, just like every other time, helps you rise above. And I hope that uh, something awesome comes out of this for you. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Thanks for joining us on this episode. This podcast is an extension of the Border Crossings Project, a community-engaged arts project funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation, the Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Mississauga. Do you have a story to share with us? Are you living a creative life out there on your own? Well, I'm keen to hear from you. Write to me at agmconnect at mississauga.ca. Thank you.